Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Van Andel Institute's public lecture on clinical trials and collaboration in Parkinson's disease. I'm Brett Holloman, Chief Philanthropy Officer for Van Andel Institute, and I'm glad to see so many of you chose to join us for today's event. I certainly miss seeing folks inside the Institute facilities, but today's virtual format has allowed folks from around the world to join us. So welcome to everyone, and we certainly invite you to visit us in person in the future. Just to mention, in the event that there are technical difficulties, today's program is being recorded and a link will be sent to you for later review. In the US alone, approximately 60,000 individuals are diagnosed with Parkinson's each year. And globally, there are an estimated 10 million people living with Parkinson's. For the millions of people around the world with Parkinson's, treatments that slow or stop disease progression are desperately needed. One promising approach to find such therapies is drug repurposing, which is rigorously evaluating medications for other diseases such as diabetes to ultimately be used as potential treatment for Parkinson's. The foremost initiative in the area of drug repurposing for Parkinson's is the International Linked Clinical Trials a program spearheaded by the United Kingdom's Cure Parkinson's in collaboration with Van Andel Institute and the John Black Foundation. This program brings together some of the world's leading Parkinson scientists, clinicians, and advocates to clinically evaluate whether existing medications can impede Parkinson's progression. Today, we have the unique privilege of hearing from three internationally renowned Parkinson's disease experts, Dr. Simon Stott, Dr. Patrick Grunden, and Dr. Richard Wise. Dr. Simon Stott is the Deputy Director of Research at Cure Parkinson's, an international supporter of both lab and clinic-based research on Parkinson's disease. Originally from New Zealand, Dr. Stott has over 15 years of experience in the field of Parkinson's research in both the academic and biotech sectors. He has been involved in lab-based research as well as clinical studies with a number of scientific publications. He also maintains the Science of Parkinson's website, which attempts to explain in plain English the research currently being conducted on Parkinson's. Up next will be Dr. Patrick Grunden, the director of v Van Andel Institute's Parkinson's Disease Focal Center and the deputy chief scientific officer at VAI. Dr. Grunden investigates molecular mechanisms in Parkinson's disease with the goal of developing new therapies aimed at slowing or stopping disease progression or repairing damage. He is one of the top cited researchers in the field of neurodegenerative disease and leads international efforts to repurpose drugs to treat Parkinson's. And finally, Dr. Richard Wise. Dr. Wise joined Cure Parkinson's in 2007 as its Director of Research and Development. He is currently engaged in a unique program of worldwide basic and clinical research in the development of radical new pharmaceutical and regenerative treatments for Parkinson's disease. This work includes a major global initiative, the International Linked Clinical Trials, which I mentioned earlier, that involves repositioning drugs into clinical trials to determine patient benefits of a large number of different therapeutics in specialist neurology hospitals around the world. If you find yourself with questions during the presentations, please submit them via the chat function or hold on to them to submit when we begin the Q&A. Now, let's begin today's program. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stott, Brunden, and Wise. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, folks. Uh, my name is Simon, and I'm the Deputy Director of Research at uh, Cure Parkinson's, and I'd like to welcome you here today. Um, I'm going to firstly start us off by discussing what exactly we mean by uh, Parkinson's. So what exactly are we talking about when we talk about Parkinson's? Uh, Parkinson's is the second most common neurodegenerative condition after Alzheimer's. It is... Um, classically uh, characterized by three motor features, oh, which is slowness of movement, rigidity of movement, and arresting tremor. Um, and it affects about 1% of the population over the age of 60. And given that there's about 10 million people worldwide affected by the condition, you can understand that there are quite a few uh, well-known public um, 
individuals in the individuals in the public domain, excuse me, who are uh, living with the condition. Individuals like Michael J. Fox and um, uh, Brian Grant, the NBA um, basketball star, have been very proactive in uh, initiating research, facilitate um, new therapies, etc. And if the slide will change here. There we go. <laughs> the motor features of Parkinson's are associated with um, the loss of dopamine neurons in the brain. And uh, dopamine is an important chemical in the brain that helps us to move about and um, do various other neurological functions. Um, and when in Parkinson's, what happens is we start to lose, for some unknown reason, we start to lose these dopamine neurons. And um, gradually, the brain becomes more inhibited when it, become, when it um, comes to movement. And we can see this. Um, we can also see, we can see we can see this in the in the slide here. You can see on the uh, right hand side there is a section of brain from a person who passed away with uh, Parkinson's and a person and an unaffect, unaffected um, individual as well. And you can see there's a lot of dark staining in the. Um, uh, section of brain towards the bottom of the screen for the um, unaffected individual, whereas the person with Parkinson's is a lot less of that dark staining. These are the dopamine neurons, the dark staining, and they project branches up into the um, brain to an area called the striatum, where they release that dopamine. Um, another feature of Parkinson's is the appearance of Lewy bodies. These Lewy bodies are small clusters of protein that densely packed and they start to populate neurons that are affected um, by the condition or that are vulnerable to the condition. And um, we'll be talking about those more in a few, in a few moments. Um, now, Parkinson's is a progressive condition. That means gradually over time, it's um, going to get worse. The symptoms will get worse. And so we can represent that schematically with a line here but with, on a downward trajectory. And generally, um, an individual who is diagnosed with Parkinson's will start to have um, will start to have a feeling that something's not quite right um, early on in the condition, and then there'll be a diagnosis, and the neurologist at that point will initiate what we call symptomatic treatments. Symptomatic treatments are therapies that cover up the symptoms of the condition, but they don't do anything for the underlying uh, cause or biology of the um, disease. Uh, they help tremendously with regards to um, better quality of life, but they don't slow, stop, or reverse the condition. So what the treatment often, the symptomatic treatments often do is improve the quality of life there, as you can see with the red line, but they continue in parallel with the general trajectory of the condition. At the moment, there's no available drugs that can change the trajectory of this course. And that's what we're here to discuss today. So there's a lot of ongoing research looking at um, therapies that will slow or stop or reverse the progress of Parkinson's. And schematically, when we look at this, we, um, using the schematic that I presented before, what we're looking for are therapies that when the neurologist um, diagnoses a person, they can initiate a um, disease modifying therapy. This, instead of a symptomatic therapy, which just covers up the symptoms of the condition, what uh, these disease modifying therapies will do is actually change the trajectory of this um, disease. So we're either going to be slowing the condition or stopping the condition completely, or ideally reversing the condition. And someday, perhaps in the future, what we'll be able to do is actually shift all of this um, initiation of disease modifying therapies back to when, even before anyone, uh, the patient actually realizes that something is not quite right. Now, we've learned a lot in the last 20 years with regards to what could be potentially underlying the progression of Parkinson's. So I'm just going to go over briefly some of the key features of the pathogenesis, what we call the pathogenesis of Parkinson's. And one, one potential um, factor in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's is inflammation. Uh, when a cell in your body um, realizes that something's not quite right, it'll send out a message to alert the cells around it and to alert the immune system that something's that it's not feeling well or that something's wrong, that it's having trouble. And these, these um, signals will, um, oops, too many, moving too fast here, yeah, sorry. 
these signal these signals will alert the immune system that something's not quite right, and the immune system can come and help. Uh, but sometimes when we have chronic inflammation, these signals can affect the cells around them and make these cells sick as well. And um, so one possible feature of um, one feature of Parkinson's we suspect is that there is this chronic low level of inflammation going on in the brain. And this is one possible avenue we could you, we could explore with regards to disease modifying therapies. If we can slow down that, and uh, we can reduce that inflammation, perhaps we can slow down the progression of the condition. Uh, we also have um, tiny little tiny little structures in all of the cells of our body, which are called mitochondria. And these mitochondria are involved with producing the power that uh, cells require to do their normal daily function. Um, and in Parkinson's, for some reason, we seem to have a reduction in the performance of mitochondria. And um, gradually, as mitochondria um, start to have lower and lower levels of efficiency, we will see cells start to get sick and start to die. So one possible way of boosting um, or slowing the progression of Parkinson's is to actually improve that mitochondrial function. So we've got therapies now that are looking at boosting mitochondrial performance. And again, hopefully that will help to slow down the progression of Parkinson's. And then I was talking about Lewy bodies before, these tiny compact um, dense clusters of uh, protein. And they start to form in um, cells, but then they, um, what we call, start to seed um, other cells where um, the, the small tiny fragments of the protein called alpha synuclein are being passed from one cell to another, um, we suspect. And this could be one of the ways that the condition is actually progressing through the brain. Um, and so what we are, what is being explored at the moment is the possibility of inhibiting these, uh, this protein from being spread from one cell to another cell, stopping that progression and hopefully slowing the, um, or completely halting the progression of Parkinson's, that is. So with this knowledge, um, all of this knowledge has led to a lot of new therapies that are focused on all three of these targets and more. And um, so therapies that will reduce the inflammation or the, um, the sticky protein, the aggregation, the, this clustering of proteins and the seeding to other cells, and also improving the metabolism or the uh, performance of uh, energy in the cells. And, um, what we, and one of the uh, ways that we've been looking at um, this is to, um, one of the ways that we've been looking at new therapies for this is the uh, initiative called the Link Clinical Trials Program. And I'm gonna hand over to Patrick to explain more about that. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Simon. So uh, I will now speak specifically about the International Linked Clinical Trials for Parkinson's disease and how this program was created and explain what we're doing. So the program was initiated in 2011 by Richard Wise, who's our next speaker, together with Tom Isaacs, who himself was affected by Parkinson's disease and one of the founders of Cure Parkinson's. Uh, he'd founded it, I think, seven years prior to this program being initiated. So Richard and Tom contacted me in 2011, at the time I was still in Sweden, and asked if I was interested in being involved in the scientific evaluation of possible drugs that could be tested for repurposing in Parkinson's. And I said, yes, I thought it was a bit of a crazy idea actually at the time. Uh, it may still be crazy, but as you will soon see, it's had some success. So this is what the group looks like, the people who work and are involved with the Link Clinical Trials Program. And you recognize a few of us. Uh, you have Richard in the middle there. You can see Simon, who is very tall at the back. And this is a group of scientists and people who are affected by Parkinson's, as well as different uh, funding agencies are represented here too. I'm gonna to describe this in some more detail. So as you heard from Simon, the idea is to slow progression, possibly stop it or even reverse it, which would be a dream. And the Link Clinical Trials Committee that you'll soon hear described in more detail will choose drugs that can be used to try to achieve this. And once they've selected drug candidates, cure Parkinson's, namely Richard Wise and Simon Stott and their team in London, 
move along and try to make a, and organize a trial. And you'll hear a couple of the trials that are ongoing being described by Richard towards the end of this presentation. So first of all, let's backtrack a little bit. What's, what's the real purpose of drug repurposing? Why don't we just develop drugs the way pharmaceutical companies normally do? Well, how do they normally develop drugs? It's conventional drug development is a very slow and incredibly expensive venture. It's estimated to get one drug into a brain disorder costs in excess of $1.5 billion. And I said that with a B, billion dollars, because there are so many failures on the way. And if you look at the timeline here, you'll see that it's first about up to five years. Once you've identified an interesting uh, uh, target, you know, uh, you heard Simon speak about inflammation, sticky proteins, and mitochondria as targets. Once you've identified targets, it may take two to five years just doing some basic uh, preclinical uh, work and trying to affect that target with a pharmaceutical compound. Then starts the arduous and very, very expensive part of the process, which is clinical development, which can take about up to eight years, going through a variety of phases of trials. First, just seeing if the drug is safe, and that's called phase one. Secondly, in phase two, seeing if the drug might have some effect in one group of patients, in one center, and if there is a strong signal that it might actually do something beneficial, one moves on to phase three, where the trial is multi-center, and one will have maybe a couple of 100 patients, whereas phase two might just be 50, 60 patients. And all of this takes time and is very, very expensive. So the difference then with the drug repurposing is that one can shortcut some of this. As you'll see in a minute, we work with drugs that have already been used in other diseases, and therefore we know a lot about their medicinal chemistry. We know about their metabolism, and we know that they are safe in at least in other diseases. And secondly, because we know they are safe, we can usually skip the phase one trial because that's already been done or they've been in, in many, many patients with other diseases. So all in all, the drug repurposing may take five to eight years instead of, of uh, the additional up to five years uh, on top of that that you would have with conventional drug development. So in practice, exactly what do we do? Uh, well, this is how we work. We meet, uh, and we, it's a group of 20 to 30 people who are uh, world leaders, or at least self-proclaimed world leaders, it sounds so pompous, uh, in Parkinson's disease. And we meet either here, the Van Andel Institute, or we meet at Cumberland Lodge, which is in the, um, in the grounds of Windsor Castle, actually not so far from where Prince Philip was um, uh, buried last week on Saturday. So it's a beautiful setting there, also very inspiring. And this group of people has uh, spent a lot of time evaluating around 25 compounds every year. And we've been doing this every year since 2012. And we're looking for compounds that we think could modify disease progression in Parkinson's disease. And here is the current group of members. And you can see that some of them are from places like Harvard or Hopkins or Cornell or UPenn, or UCSF, NIH, Fox Foundation, Cambridge University in the UK. So from esteemed locations, very, very good and strong scientists with Parkinson's disease. And during the year, they spend a lot of time together with Simon and Richard reviewing the literature, looking out for interesting drugs that are safe in other diseases, mostly drugs that have been tested and used extensively in other diseases, and could affect, for example, inflammation, mitochondria, or sticky proteins. And that can generate a long list during the year. There'd be lots of emails going back and forth. And in particular, Richard and Simon spend a lot of time evaluating the supporting data for a drug, saying whether it seems kind of promising or not. And they generate a shorter list from, from perhaps, uh, let's say there are 80 or 100 compounds being floated in one year. And that shorter list is then moved on to the next stage. During the second half of that year, 
Simon and Richard and some other people who, whom they recruit will generate dossiers. And I'm going to explain what that is in a second. So they're going to write long dossiers for about some 20 compounds every year. And these dossiers are then handed out to the committee I just showed you. The Link Clinical Trials Scientific Committee sit at home for two, three weeks and pre-score each drug. They evaluate them. And I'll exactly show how that's done before they come to the meeting here at Van Andel or over in Windsor Park. And the evaluation of the drugs, uh, I'll show you exactly what the criteria are. So this is what a dossier looks like. It has information about the drug candidate, its biology, is it safe and how has it been tested in other, in other diseases? And why do we think it can, for example, inhibit inflammation or stop sticky proteins or how and why could it boost the energy production in cells? And then comes a long section where there's details about the scientific studies that have been done with that drug in Parkinson's disease models. And this might be mice, it might be cultured cells. It might also be evidence from epidemiology where the drug has been used, for example, in diabetes. And in type two diabetes are some drugs that have been used that then have been associated with a slightly lower risk of Parkinson's disease. And that suggests that they might be helpful in somehow slowing the underlying disease process. And all of this is summarized, all the preclinical data. There's also a summary of what's been done clinically in the other disease. So this is a thick document. You can see we're talking about some 20 pages for each one of those 20 drugs. And the process is then that uh, I, I've described it goes on for a whole year, lots of preparation to get down to those 20, 25 drugs. Those are then sent out as a PDF file to the whole committee. We also evaluate what's the intellectual property landscape. Is, is there anything that will be an obstacle for taking this into to trials in Parkinson's because sometimes patents can get in the way. And the hard work reading at home goes on for two to three weeks before that uh, one and a half or two day meeting at the Van Andel or uh, near Windsor Castle. Uh, as we meet, based on the initial scores that we generated at home, we throw away about a third of the compounds because there's some consensus that something is lacking and they're not the best ones. And we focus our discussion on the top third or top two thirds. And then we sit down during one and a half days and do the scoring. And just as a, a matter of a detail, we reverse the scoring scale when we sit down and discuss. This is so we're not locked in to our preconceived biases that we generated at our desks at home. So we allow that discussion in real life uh, in the committee to influence the final score because we, we don't tie into that numerical score we gave before. It's, it's just a different uh, scale. And when we have finished this, oh, I should say, what are we scoring? So what are the criteria? First of all, it's safety. It's very important that the drug is safe. And uh, most of the ones that reach the dossier stage have a, a good safety profile. Sometimes we will discover during our discussion that there are some aspects that uh, perhaps make the drug less suitable in an elderly population, for example. The other criteria is, is really the rationale scientifically. You know, does it really make sense that this could boost energy production or does it make sense that it would reduce inflammation? And we're very, very interested in whether it can get into the brain. The brain is shielded from the rest of the body by something that we call the blood brain barrier. So it's um, sort of physically difficult for drugs that are in the blood to get into the brain. Uh, sometimes we actually discuss drugs that we think could affect the periphery of the body, peripheral organs. And we now know that Parkinson's disease has a lot of uh, features that involve the gut or, um, or other parts of the peripheral organs. So, so occasionally we'll say this drug is relevant because it can target some inflammation in the gut. We're interested in what's called pharmacokinetics and dynamics. And that's how the drug is handled in the body. So if you take a pill, you know, how high levels do you get? How quickly does the body eliminate them? And, and what are the metabolites and so forth? And we, we also are interested if we can evaluate what we call target engagement. 
So just to give you one example, so if we're trying to inhibit inflammation in the brain, we take this pill that we think would work, we will then in the committee ask ourselves, is there a way to measure if that drug actually did reduce inflammation in the brain? Or will we just have to guess whether that was the case? Having an ability to measure target engagement is important to us because if the drug doesn't work, we can know if it was because it didn't really get to its target or if it actually biologically wasn't very smart uh, as the drug for this disease. And then, of course, a lot of discussion about animal models, cell culture models, and there is no Parkinson's disease in mice and monkeys. So all we have is models, things that might feature some aspects, the inflammation or the loss of energy production or, or the, the formation of Lewy bodies. And we're particularly keen on drugs that have been tested in multiple laboratories in multiple models, because that gives us a higher level of confidence that they could be relevant. Well, you can imagine that uh, after the meeting, we have maybe two to five compounds at the committee after those one and a half days said, these are really interesting. They're safe. They seem to have the right pharmacology. They seem to be able to get into the brain. We love the preclinical data. And we then move those forward. And, and this means that typically, again, Richard and Simon and the team at Cure Parkinson's start looking around the world for interesting sites where the trials can be done. Sometimes one drug is tested in one site. Other times it might be that there are multiple sites involved for one drug. We also then explore funding opportunities. You've heard that Cure Parkinson's, Van Andel Institute, John Black Foundation are all standing funding members of this program and put in a lot of money, and importantly, some money that has been donated by some of you who are listening here today. And this is really how we can run this program. But on top of that, we look for government funding, we look for other foundations, and we also go to the drug companies and ask, this is your drug. You're using it for diabetes or you're using it for asthma or something else. Would you be interested in helping us, perhaps uh, giving some money to the trial or supplying the drug for free? And we, we can then facilitate and move forward. And then as a committee uh, and as individuals in the committee, we interact and re recommend the sites, the trial sites, about how the trial should be designed. There are many different ways you can design a trial. Uh, aimed at slowing this progression or stopping it the way Simon described it. And each and every drug may have features that make it more or less suitable for a long trial, a short trial. And in some cases, we may focus on the motor symptoms, the triad that Simon mentioned, the three major symptoms. In other cases, we might be more interested in things such as um, cognitive decline, uh, improve or, or worse memory in trying to inhibit this depends on what drug we're looking at so i'm now about to hand over to richard who will describe some of the trials i just want to show you the complete pipeline as it looks today with in purple uh, completed trials and the name of the drug is is inserted in each one of the bars uh, then we have in green the trials that are currently ongoing and you can see the timeline at the top there with the years and then finally, at the bottom in blue are some of the trials that are, are currently planned. There are actually a few more. We've been somewhat affected by COVID-19 and the pandemic. So, so things that perhaps would have moved it forward a little bit earlier are now slowed down, but they're picking up back up again. Uh, so Richard will describe primarily the, the trials at the top, the one called exenatide by durin and the one that's called ambroxol because as you see they've gone into phase three which means there's been some degree of success here some really exciting success and um, he'll also mention that uh, the first drug there has similar compounds that are being tested uh, they're in the green now liraglutide lixacenatide so so because a similar mechanism mechanism of action is present in another drug they've also been used there and i hope now you'll be excited to hear from richard wise who is 
As his name suggests, he's wise. He's also an accomplished um, classical guitarist, but I'm not sure he'd be playing today. He and his spouse have ducks in their backyard behind the curtain. And finally, uh, he was a personal friend of Harold Pinter, uh, the Nobel Prize winner. He's also played cricket with Prince Philip. Is that a good enough introduction, Richard? You, are you think you're ready now? Thank you. That did sound like an obituary. <laughs> <laughs> Look, thank you. And, and you know, I don't think I've had a, an opportunity over the last 10 years to thank you personally for um, for you and um, all the Van Andel have done for this. So thank you so much for sharing it for the last decade. Um, it's been, uh, your contribution's been outstanding. So look, we, um, Patrick's mentioned some of the trials that we're doing. Uh, in, in, in fact, he also alluded to the fact there are quite a few others underway. Um, but if I come here and move to the next slide, actually, I need to go back to the previous one. No, I don't. Right. Um, okay, so this is... Um, We've used this, um, it's the 2012, the very first meeting we ever did. Um, we've had eight or nine meetings since then, and I think we've prioritized around 45 compounds to go into clinical trials, and we're, we're up at around 25, I think, at the moment. So we've still got lots to... Um, to get into trial, but I want to go through this list. Actually, this slide is tiny for me, but I think I can remember what, um, what's there. So Bigerian and Lixisenatide and Liraglutide are all GLP-1 agonists, and I'm gonna come on to those in a minute. Uh, up the top was also Simvastatin. This was prioritized by the committee in 2012, uh, and that trial has finished. Um, and it reported, um, uh, well, no, it hasn't reported yet, but uh, there was a press release a few months ago. I, I noticed that Camille Carroll, who was our chief neurologist who ran that trial, 230 patients, 23 hospitals, um, I think she's on the call. So, um, so uh, I, I hope I, I do her trial justice. Uh, further down the list there, uh, I seem to remember we have deferoprone. Uh, that trial is still ongoing. It's a very, very big trial in many countries, 338 patients. Um, I remember that uh, citagliptin was on that list. And we actually, after this meeting, as I say, we, a few years have gone on since then, we actually decided that another gliptin is they, they also used like the GLP-1 agonists that we're using, they're also used to treat diabetes. There's a good reason for this. Um, we actually started a trial using allogliptin um, and uh, that's underway. I think on that list was nilotinib. We, uh, we ran a trial of, of that, um, which uh, treatment used for um, uh, leukemia. So this is a drug repurposing exercise. So we're using diabetes drugs. We're using drugs um, like deferoprone, which is used for iron chelation. And why do you need to do that? Well, if you over transfuse someone uh, with blood, you give them too much iron and the body can't get rid of iron. So they develop drugs to get iron out. But in Parkinson's, uh, you get a buildup of, of iron, the metal, in a, the part of the brain which we think is responsible for uh, controlling movement. And this is just a slight buildup of iron, but, but uh, we, we think it's, um, it has an inflammatory and um, oxidative effect on, on the brain, and it's, it's good to get it out, we feel, which is why we've been doing this trial on, on deferoprone. So um, if I can move down to the next slide, Bigerian. So we're back on the top of that list. So Bigerian is, was developed to, it's, 
it mimics a, a hormone which is produced by the gut. So that's controlling digestion, but it also controls energy. Um, and we heard earlier that energy is extremely important in Parkinson's because the cells don't appear to have as much energy as they should because the mitochondria, which produce the, the, the power, don't seem to work so well. And uh, we're using these GLP-1 agonists in trials, not only to increase the amount of energy available for the cells or the neurons to do what they're meant to be doing, but also uh, there's an anti-inflammatory component to uh, the GLP-1 agonists. So GLP-1 in the body is produced um, as I said, for digestion, but it only lasts a couple of minutes in the blood because it's broken down by enzymes. So the trick that the diabetes um, uh, medics did was to make a form of that um, uh, of that um, of, G of GLP one that doesn't get broken down very quickly, and it lasts for hours. So that means that we we originally were giving a twice daily injection now it's once a week and now there's an oral formulation of of another drug so this um we about a decade ago we realized from the preclinical work in parkinson's that the glp1 agonists were likely to be they had compelling reason to test in parkinson's Patients and the linked into uh, international uh, clinical trials committee agreed, and so we put by durin. Well, it was called exenocide at that time. We put it into a trial. Uh, I convinced a very nice uh, neurologist, young man called Tom Fortney. There, there he is his pictures there um, to uh, to take this on uh, as a clinical trial. And since then, there was a second clinical trial, and now we're moving into a phase three trial, and I'll come on to that in a second. But just to say that we we had uh, fairly good clinical results. We, we found that some patients responded and some didn't respond uh, so much to this drug. But um, we the result of the first trial we did uh, prompted us to do a second, much bigger, more detailed trial. And that work was published in The Lancet. Um, and I think those are the results there. They're, they're tiny on my screen, but, um, but um, then there was, so it was a one year trial. And then we, we took patients off the, the drug and we re-examined them after 12 weeks off the drug. So what we've what we've done is um, so that that phase two trial was um, was completed and it prompted us to do a phase three trial. So the how it works in medicine when you're developing drugs is that the phase three trial is the trial that you you do on a larger group of patients uh, and it's a preliminary to convincing the regulators, the drug regulators of each individual country that this should be licensed for use in Parkinson's patients. So we're on that route now. Um, if this phase three trial that's currently underway, it started, it's stalled because of COVID, but it's restarted 200 patients. If that does very well, then we can well imagine that this will be um, uh, approved for use, not just for diabetes, but also for, for uh, Parkinson's patients. So let me move forward um, to, yeah, so uh, that's the phase three study. We're, we're funding additional uh, stud sub-studies with patients having wearables. And so in the same breath, luaglutide is another GLP-1 agonist. It's slightly different, has slightly different properties, but it's the same mimic of a, of a gut hormone. 
So we, we started that. I wanted to see how these GLP-1 agonists could be used in different groups of Parkinson's patients. Early stage, in this case, um, they're later stage Parkinson's patients, but they're also insulin resistant, which means that they're also on the way to getting diabetes. I mean, after all, this is a diabetes drug. So this particular study is being done in Cedar Cedar Sinai in California, and we'll find out if um, if this approach works well in that group of patients. And then lixisenatide is yet another. Uh, the, the first one was made by AstraZeneca. The second one by Novo Nordisk. Sanofi make this drug, and again, it's slightly different from the others. And we've got this in early stage patients, about 150 of them in 21 hospitals across France. And, and this trial should finish, I think, later this year. So we're very intrigued by the, um, we're going to have these three results coming out within, you know, over the next year or two. So that, that should be very promising. So just moving on, briefly to the issue, uh, another issue in Parkinson's, and Simon allu alluded to this earlier, where you get um, an inappropriate um, buildup of, of alpha-synuclein in the brain. And so just like we, we're trying to give more energy to the cells to do what cells do, but also we're exploring ways that we can Im improve their waste disposal. So, um, so we've got a slide here that depicts that. And there's a drug called Ambroxol. It's been used in Europe for 40 years to relieve very congested chests, um, uh, asthma and, and those sort of uh, con conditions where you get a lot of phlegm. And who knew that the it had a potential repurposed application for use in Parkinson's? So, um, but that's what the science proved. So it there's a, a very important enzyme which is involved in getting rid of waste products from cells, and ambroxol addresses increases the activity of that enzyme. So it makes sense further down the line to use something like, um, like the GLP-1 agonist with ambroxol. So you're, you're providing more energy and also you're, you're getting um, the waste products out of the system that much better. So, um, so here's our uh, chief investigator, Professor um, Anthony Shapira in London. He's done the initial trial for us, a phase two trial, and it, um, uh, the results were absolutely wonderful. Um, the, the, um, we found that the drug uh, did what, it, what we wanted it to do in terms of affecting the, um, the, the level in the brain. And I think in with most situations, we would have we would have expanded the size of that trial and um, uh, before we wanted moved into a phase three. But we we feel that in this particular case um, everything's lined up quite nicely. So we want to move straight, save two or three years, and go straight into a phase three trial. So we're just planning that at the moment, and we've got um, so th this is. We're initially looking at this in patients who have GBA mutations. So some, a few percent of Parkinson's patients get Parkinson's because of a family um, inheritance. And in this case, it's a glucocerebrosidase, GBA mutation. And they, are, they seem particularly susceptible to this, um, to this enzyme issue that, that affects waste disposal from the cell. But we actually think it's going to be a good drug for all Parkinson's patients, but we've got to prove it. That's our job. So what we've done is we've set up a, um, a program called Frontline, where we're going to do a genetic screening of maybe up to 2,000 patients 
for enrollment into this trial and, and to trials that uh, of similar drugs and um, similar drugs that affect that enzyme. And if this appeals to you to, um, to take part, then uh, you can see there's ways to sign up for that, uh, that genetic testing to see if, it, if you would be um, suitable for um, enrollment in this trial or one of those other trials. So let me give that short advert on, on that. So just my final two slides. Um, Patrick asked me to talk about the Australian Parkinson's mission. So we, we set up a program by, by working with the federal government in Australia. It's a five-year program. We're going to do a number of clinical trials. We've started three of them already, despite COVID, because it was very, they, had, they weren't heavily affected by COVID in Australia. So we've, we've particularly in New South Wales. So we've, we've managed to get uh, three trials underway. They are, I think, about 10 months in. Um, so they involve uh, two to 300 patients. And I have to say that I've noticed Anthony Cooper, uh, who is the uh, director of the scientific program, this is both a clinical program and some superb science behind it as well. I see that he, even from Australia, the middle of the night, um, is, uh, is on the call. So that's wonderful, Anthony. And so we've done this as what we call a, a MAM study. So that's multi-arm, um, but basically it's more efficient if we, if we take in this case, we're studying three drugs and a placebo arm rather than doing three separate trials, each with their own placebo arm. So it's, it's a more efficient way. It's slightly more cost effective, but it also increases, uh, we think, quality because every, all of the trials are done the same way. So, um, look, I think what we wanted to do 10 years ago was a very bold initiative. Parkinson's needed a very bold initiative to try to pick it up by the scruff of the neck and get to the, the bottom of what's going to work to stop disease progression. And I think we've, um, I think you can be the judge of, of, of how we're doing, but I, I see my time's up. Patrick, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, well, thank Richard. You. It's over to Brett. Yes, thank you, Simon, Patrick, and Richard. We appreciate your uh, time this afternoon. Uh, as you can see, um, we've pulled everybody up on the screen and we'll ask our speakers to unmute themselves <laughs> as a friendly reminder. But uh, now's the time for questions and answers. Uh, and once again, just a reminder that today's presentation is being recorded, so we will send that out to you in the coming days. But uh, Patrick or Richard, I think you've alluded to this, uh, Richard, in your closing remarks. From your perspective, what is the biggest benefit of a collaboration like the one between VAI and Cure Parkinson's? Patrick, I'll let you speak first, and then Simon or Richard, feel free to jump in. Well, there are several features, I think, that are really beneficial. One is that we've gathered uh, international expertise in this committee. So the people who sit in the committee have a variety of backgrounds going from genetics, molecular, cellular biology, uh, through to clinical neurology, obviously, lots of Parkinson neurologists, and then even uh, statistics and clinical trial design. So our, we're fortunate to have all these ex experts heavily invested and in spending a lot of their time on this. Uh, that's been a huge plus. Of course, being able to fundraise on two sides of the Atlantic and now also in Australia, because there's a, a major government grant going into the Australian arm of link clinical trials. That, of course, has been very important because we can then test many more drugs in, in more trials. And I think the international flavor of this collaboration means that we, uh, we get some degree of credibility with the drug companies and all the hard work that Richard and Simon do during the year talking to the drug companies they view us, I think, as a serious player now in the field. And there have even been drug companies that have approached Richard and said, uh, could you 
look at this. We have an idea within our company that we perhaps would like to try a drug that we have for another disease in Parkinson's. You have a bunch of experts already. Could you help us review this and give us input? And could you maybe suggest how this could be tested? So I think just having this intellectual power, the international flavor and having the financial backing by having many partners contributing are really major factors. Great. Thank you, Richard or Simon. Anything else to add to Patrick's remarks? Simon? Yeah, I think uh, basically Parkinson's is an extremely complicated uh, condition and it's going to take more than just uh, one organization to um, deal with it. So the more collaborative uh, efforts, the, the better. Um, and uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a great example of that. Wonderful, thank you. A question from the group, uh, is Prevagen helpful in reducing brain fog? Richard, maybe you can take that. I didn't, I didn't understand the name of the compound. So the name of the compound uh, is Prevagen. So this is an over-the-counter, uh, heavily advertised compound okay. TV. It's supposed to improve memory, and I must admit, I, I don't know the scientific basis for it. Um, it's not a um, drug that's prescribed by doctors per se, I think. I think it's just over the counter. And I don't think it's available in the UK. I've not heard of it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Richard, for, uh, for you for this one, though, uh, for slow progressing diseases like Parkinson's, isn't it possible that phase three clinical trials might actually take longer than just three to four years? Well, the Xenotide trial is, is for three years, uh, sorry, for two years. The Isratapine trial, which was uh, completed a year or two ago, was for three years. Um, but because there are hundreds of patients involved and because it takes a long time to recruit them and maybe up to 85, 90 hospitals are involved in some of those trials. It takes four to five years for the, um, for the trial to be completed. So patients may be on the trial individually for two years, but if they were the first patient recruited, they would be off by two years. And it's probably be coming to the end of the new recruitment at two years. So it'll still run for, for three and a half years with active patients. So it just takes a very long time. It's very hard to uh, recruit some groups of Parkinson's patients. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just a very time consuming thing to, to have a lot of patients come in and be evaluated for how appropriate they are to be on a particular trial. Um, that might take three or four hours to evaluate. Um, and there may be other, other sort of tests, genetic tests or whatever. So look, even though a trial may be a couple of years for an individual patient across the whole thing, over 300 patients, that's probably gonna take you four years to complete. Thank you. Uh, maybe I could add there. Sorry, Brett, could I just oh. add to that? So the reason why I need so many patients in these trials is that Parkinson's disease, as Simon mentioned, is a very complex disorder, but it's also complicated because there are almost no two patients that are alike. The rate of progression, the types of symptoms vary tremendously between individuals. And then if you're doing research and science, trying to see if a drug slows progression, you need a large number of individuals to even out the variation between the groups. And uh, it, it's a challenging business because you also need the duration of the trial to actually see deterioration to begin with. And then on top of that, you have this variation between individuals. Great. Thank you, Patrick, that's helpful. Uh, Simon, let's start with you on this one. Uh, with the Link Clinical Trials Initiative, are you aiming to cover uh, Parkinson's plus syndromes through ILCT or just idiopathic Parkinson's disease? Uh, basically just idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Gradually there is a consensus building that Parkinson's is not a singular condition, but rather a set of um, 
or what we call a syndrome, a, a, a group of conditions that have a similar sort of features. And uh, we're trying to subdivide park, idiopathic Parkinson's into these um, subtypes uh, based primarily on clinical features or on um, quite often now genetic features. Uh, the genetic component is very small, however, um, uh, that, we, that we have researched to date. Um, but no, the uh, link clinical trials is typically focused on idiopathic Parkinson's, not Parkinson's plus. Parkinson's plus, for those who are not aware, is um, conditions that are very similar to Parkinson's but don't get the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Conditions like progressive uh, um, multiple systems atrophy. Um, and, uh, but we do, or we do communicate with groups that are conducting clinical trials uh, on these conditions. Uh, for example, there is a tri clinical trial here in the UK now for exenatide in folks with MSA. Uh, so uh, the, the, the efforts that go into the link clinical trials are not solely focused on uh, Parkinson's in that regard, but can, be, um, have, can have implications for other conditions. Patrick? And maybe we can say that the uh, MSA trial in England has been uh, partly sponsored by a US-based patient advocate group, uh, Defeat MSA. So it's, that's also becoming an international effort. So this is great. And I think there was clearly some inspiration uh, from the Parkinson Link Clinical Trials Program uh, when this MSA team got together. Thank you. So along those lines, how is Parkinson diagnosed? From my knowledge, it's not a blood prick or a blood test. How does the diagnostic process take place? Patrick, do you want to start with that? Sure. So it is a clinical diagnosis. It's based on the, uh, the clinical features of the patient and the, the history of those symptoms. Uh, then typically the patient is, is given medication and uh, the medication, the primary medication is that type that affects the dopamine system. And if they respond well, it is very likely to be Parkinson's disease. Today with modern brain imaging techniques, one can also perform a variety of brain imaging uh, examinations to strengthen that clinical diagnosis, but it is primarily a clinical diagnosis. That said, and this is, now we're getting into some very complex science, even when uh, very experienced clinicians diagnose Parkinson's disease, it may turn out that the pathology in the brain is more complex. It's not just the classical Parkinson's. And the final answer one can only get upon microscopic examination on the brain when the patients die decades later. So there are a number of individuals who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's, but upon autopsy are found to have Parkinson-like disease or, or Parkinson's with other features of pathology. So what used to be a pretty simple di uh, pathological diagnosis, when I started in this field 40 years ago, you know, you had to lose those dopamine neurons and you had to have Lewy bodies. Today, it's, it's much more blurred and the, the, the borders between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, for example, are not so strict anymore. We have a lot more to learn about this. Thank you. Uh, Richard or Simon, anything to add? Well, I think we could I think, Go ahead, I think Richard. Go ahead, Richard. The, the uh, diagnosis of Parkinson's can, can be, be very difficult sometimes. And uh, a, a general practitioner will not see many Parkinson's patients is in his entire career and will only be accurate about 60% of the time. And then you, you, if you go to a, a hospital neurologist, they're only accurate about 85% of the time. I mean, at first visit. Uh, so it, and sometimes some patients could, can take two years to be, uh, to have a confirmed diagnosis. Sometimes it's only when they're given uh, dopaminergic therapy as a, as a diagnostic test, and they respond to those to that dopaminergic uh, therapy, um, is a, actually clinches the diagnosis. So it can be quite difficult. And I think we all remember Robin Williams, who sadly died, I think, in two thousand fourteen. And initially, when he died, uh, um, it was said that he had Parkinson's. 
turned out upon autopsy and, and reviewing his documents, his wife went out many, 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 many months later saying it was formally now diagnosed as uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, which is closely related disease, again, with blurred lines towards Parkinson's disease. So it just illustrates, you know, the, the complexity of this. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Uh, Richard or Patrick uh, or Simon, any one of you, uh, is there still a significant pool of repurposed compounds that could be considered by international and clinical trials? Uh, and if you um, end up going through the entire pool, uh, would you begin considering novel compounds or what are your thoughts? Well, about 20% about of our of what we discuss in the committee are new compounds. Uh, so traditionally, drug re repurposed drugs are drugs used in a disease, another disease, and then you see some compelling biochemical reason why it would also show great promise for Parkinson's. But you've got to be ahead of that game. And now we see uh, new biotech companies coming through, making a drug for this disease, and we'll we'll see that it has characteristics that why would we want to wait until it you know in the next five years for that to be approved for use in ophthalmology or whatever it is? Uh, we'll get on the phone and talk to that those those companies and say, hey, we think you've also got a drug um, which is potentially benef beneficial for, for our Parkinson's patients. And they'll tend to think, wow, okay, we only knew it was going to be useful for this condition, but now we've got a new potential outlet for it, um, a, a new market. And they'll work really um, collaboratively with us. And there's, 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 and sometimes on two occasions, they have paid for the entire trial. Uh, for, for for Parkinson's because we've convinced them that uh, when they never even knew that their drug was had promise in Parkinson's. So it's a constant dialogue. We're talking to 50 or 60 pharmaceutical companies, biotechs at any one time. So just be aware of what's going on. Breakthroughs happen all the time in different areas. Sometimes they really affect you. And Richard is describing how there are new drugs sort of entering the market and becoming interesting for us. But at the same time, over this last decade, it's clear that our view of Parkinson's disease pathogenesis, which Simon described in those slides, those three areas, that shifted a little bit. So we're also more interested perhaps in certain types of drugs than we might have been 10 years ago. And I'll give you an example, which is the anti-inflammatory types of drugs. We're more and more interested in that because in the last 10 years, there's been more and more evidence that inflammation seems to be playing an important role. So there are changes in two areas. Sure. I'll just add, I mean, you I'll just add to Richard's comment before um, that one of the unforeseen consequences of, um, or one of not consequences, but outputs of a program like this is that it stimulates um, new research in, in areas. Uh, for example, the Xenotide results have stimulated multiple biotech companies to start exploring this domain, where previously they were only interested in diabetes mm. with their with their GLP-1 agonists. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's kind of one of the positive consequences that come from a huge initiative like this. Great, thank you. Uh, a couple more questions. We've had a few that have come in. We won't be able to get to all of them, but uh, what we will do is we'll email the panel the questions so that we can get back to you with a response. Uh, otherwise, my fear, unfortunately, is we could be here for a good portion of the remainder of the day, but we need to let folks back into the labs to do the work. Uh, so two last questions. Uh, what prevents getting additional clinical trials started? Is it funding? knowledge it's mainly funding um but sometimes it's drug supply it's sometimes we we um we don't have enough data about safety in a parkinsonian group i mean if a drug's used in another disease for six weeks 
that doesn't tell us anything about what it's like in a, a Parkinson's uh, cohort of patients for a year. So sometimes we have to do some preliminary um, preliminary studies before we actually go for a much longer trial. So there's a number of things, but I think I think the overwhelmingly the limiting factor is is finance, and we've got twenty. 20 to 25 trials underway. We've we've haven't had to fund them all, but most of them in one way or another. Um, but we have another another 20 or so drugs on our roster that we want to get into trial. And I think if we had the um, if we had the the finance, that's exactly what we would do. Thank you. I see nodding heads, so we'll uh, assume that that is the, the primary answer. Uh, this is a question for all three of you to wrap us up. Simon, we're going to start with you. Uh, if you could wave a magic wand, uh, where do you see the ILC initiative taking us in the next five years? Um, well, obviously, what we're looking for are molecules that will slow stop or um, reverse Parkinson's and a curative therapy for lack of a better word. Uh, the, uh, the complicating factor is that everybody's at a different stage of Parkinson's when they're diagnosed with Parkinson's and when, you're not going to get a single silver bullet that's going to solve the problem for everybody. So what I'm hoping for with um, the ILC initiative is that we will be able to put forward a range of molecules that will have an impact on various parts of the condition. Um, and we will be able to provide the community with um, a tailor-made, personalized kind of approach uh, for Parkinson's. Uh, that's yeah, that's kind of a, that's kind of my dream. Wonderful. Thank you, Patrick. You next. Five years. Yes, I agree with uh, I agree with Simon. So of course we're very excited about the results that will come out in the next two three years that Richard alluded to with with, for example, the GLP-1 agonist and with Ambroxol. So that will be extremely interesting. Uh, but I totally agree with what Simon said, personalized medicine, perhaps having some kind of biomarker that will help us differentiate who is more likely and who's less likely to respond to a certain drug. And as Simon mentioned, being specific for the different phases of the disease, it probably slightly different molecular processes that dominate during the different parts of the disease. And very last point, perhaps five years from now, if we have a couple of drugs that look interesting, could we start looking at combination therapy? So we hit the disease from more than one side, you know, left, right hook and left uppercut. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard, we'll end with you. Five years. Yeah, so I do have a magic wand, the pen. <laughs> Huge impact on the world. This particular pen says Spectrum Health Neuroscience. They're next door to Van Andel. I'm not sure why I've got that, not a Van Andel pen, but here it is. It, there, there it is, Spectrum Health. So look, I, uh, Patrick just stole my, stole my thunder. So about combinations. So I think, I mean, if you look at most oncology trials, they 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 now got drug combinations, and this is this seems to be how a number of diseases are being tackled. It's difficult with Parkinson's because uh, we have to do such long trials, and we have to prove drugs work as monotherapies on their own before we start to put them together. But I. I I think a combination of individual personal genetics. What are your genetics? Not the next guy. What are your genetics? And what drugs will be appropriate for you? What drug combinations will be appropriate for you? And then I'm determined to push this back into what we call prodromal Parkinson's, where people have got the signs of Parkinson's for some years before they, before they get the overt um, movement, um, uh, you know, more obvious symptoms, but loss of sense of smell and and uh, and sleep issues and uh, uh, gastrointestinal issues. So we can we can give those combinations to people five years before they might get their symptoms 
and eradicate the disease. Um, eradicate is too strong a word, but I mean, drastically reduce the number of emerging cases, uh, as well as treating the ones, uh, the patients that have already started to get their, their motor symptoms. So look, it's a, it's a long game because it, it, it's the trials do inevitably have to go on for a long time. Um, but I see a very clear path forward about how we're going to, to deal with this combination of genetics and drug combinations. And five years from now, we might have all our ducks <laughs> in a row. So maybe, Richard, can you draw that curtain so we can see if your ducks are in a row outside in the winter? <laughs> Those of you who don't know about Richard's ducks, let's have a look. Are they in a row? There are no ducks out there. They're, they're, <laughs> well, we better get them lined up. You know, never work with children or animals. You know the rule. <laughs> uh, you can't trust them. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. We do uh, We do hope for all the ducks to get in a row. Uh, and one of the ways that they've already started to line up is through this partnership with Cure Parkinson's and Bananal Institute, John Black Foundation, and many others from around the world uh, that have come together to tackle this complex and uh, challenged disease that we call Parkinson's. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Stott, Dr. Brunden, and Dr. Wise once again for your insightful presentations today and for your time. Uh, if we can give you another big virtual round of applause. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your schedules today to join us. Uh, my apologies that we couldn't get to all of the questions, but I promise that we will get an answer uh, to you via email or in some other format. Um, but thank you for your interest in and passion for science and for research and the power of knowledge, discovery, and collaboration. Uh, these events at Van Andel Institute are not possible without the support from our passionate community of supporters, sponsors, advocates, including all of you gathered here. Our next virtual public lecture called Fueling the Immune System will be held on May 13 and will examine the critical relationship between met metabolism and immunity. So join us for that. And to learn about more upcoming events and to stay active and engaged with all of the great work happening at Van Andel Institute, please head to our website at vadi.org. You can sign up for our mailing list, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. Uh, all of these are great avenues for learning about our latest research and education initiatives and our many science-centered events like the public lecture series. Again, whether virtually or in person, uh, we certainly hope to see you all again. Have a great rest of your day.